Praise the Lord. God bless you. Amen. Eswatini. Amen. I love it. Well, I mean, let's put our hands together for the angels of our house, uh, Pastor Kevin and Helen. I love you so much. I, I, met, them in, um, uh, I met them in Zimbabwe at the, friend of, uh, at, the house, at the house of a dear friend in Celebration Church, uh, Pastor Tom Duchel. And it's, so it's an honor to be able to be here with them, and we just already have fallen in love with them. Amen. Amen. Well, uh, how many watch me on YouTube or have seen me on the Supernatural with Sid Roth, maybe, maybe Benny? And wait, raise your hand. If you ever seen me before on, on some other show, <laughs> amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, my people. Amen. 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 The rest of you, welcome to the ministry of Francis Mouse. <laughs> amen. They tell me I'm really good, so I hope that I can convince the others. You know, the other ones already know that. <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord. We're going to get right into it. Let me just tell you how the three days are going to go. Today, I'm just going to talk to you about understanding altars and how to destroy them. And then tomorrow, we're going to be dealing with uh, jumping bloodlines. Uh, it's going to be amazing. Tomorrow, we're going to have a red ribbon, so get ready to come and uh, say goodbye to a lot of things that are swimming in your bloodline that shouldn't be there. It's going to be an amazing time. We have had so many miracles, creative miracles, when we do jump in the bloodline, you know. And um, uh, then, when, then, then Thursday, Thursday, our last service, I'm going to talk to you about what has become one of the most powerful nuclear revelations the Lord has ever given me. And the revelation is, I speak to the earth, release prosperity. Amen. We're going to be talking to the land. We are going to heal the land of Swazi, Eswatini. We're going to re heal the land because how many know you cannot prosper if the land is sick? But not only that, we are going to unlock your own prosperity as a believer. It's going to be an amazing time. So we have, we, these three days are going to be amazing. Keep inviting people. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. If they, you know, invite them in Jesus' name. If they don't believe it, just bribe them. Bring them here anyway. <laughs> you know, bribe them with shema or pop or something. You know, Africans are easy to bribe. Okay. Amen. Man, God, how much time do I have? Just want to make sure I'm, I'm, I'm saying in town. All right. My God. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> I looked at 35 minutes. Oh, my God. So I had more time than that. Thank you so much, man of God. Are you guys ready? Yes. Are you ready to study, to be delivered, to go to another level? Okay. Now, the way my teaching methodology and the modality behind my teaching is to teach in such a way that not only do you get delivered yourself, but you become a deliverer. Amen? So that it's, you understand it so well, you begin to help other people because of what you now know. So let's turn in your Bibles very quickly to the book of Ephesians 6, verse 12. Uh, I'm going I'm to use the King James on this one. Uh, again, our message is understanding altars and how to destroy them. Thank you, them. My God, the media team managed to get the pie point already. Thank you, baby. She worked very hard and she got it up there. So you can actually follow the PowerPoint. Amen. You can actually be smarter than me tonight. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against what? Principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against what? Spiritual wickedness in what? High places. Amen. How many know that we are in a real and very dynamic spiritual world? You know that? You know, and uh, here Paul, Apostle, uh, the Apostle Paul mentions it. Uh, Several rankings. In the realm of the spirit is a place of ranking. Several ranking of the demonic uh, 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 hierarchy. Uh, the first one he mentioned is principalities. Principalities are the highest ranking celestial beings or fallen angels in Satan's kingdom. Uh, as, they are, uh, as their ranking suggests, they are the ones that uses that rule as ruling spirits over each, over nations. The principalities, they are, more, they are more concerned about territories than they are about individuals. When Daniel was praying and fasting for 21 days, it was a principality over the, I call the Prince of Persia that stopped him from stopping, stopped the angel that was bringing the answer from coming to him 21 days. Shows you the level of power some of these principalities can have over regions. Then we have powers. We have a ranking of, of, of uh, we have a ranking of angels called powers in the fallen kingdom. As the name suggests, powers are celestial beings, fallen angels, okay? 
That means they, are rank, they outrank the demons we're dealing with. Demons are the ones that get into people. These are angels that operate from the outside but can get in if they need to, but very rarely because of the different, different assignments of what they do. Our powers are, 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 are responsible for manifesting the supernatural uh, uh, fake signs and wonders. You know, that's why you can see in Buddhism and different things, you can see real supernatural things happening. If they were not, there will be people who will not be able to follow them. They are, I mean, uh, my friend was a former Buddhist monk, one of the highest, went all the way to Tibet, you know, and got delivered by Jesus, you know, on a 20, you know, got delivered by Jesus on a 21 day fast to Buddha. Isn't the Lord amazing? He knows how to store, how to entrap. The, I mean, he was fasting for 21 days to Buddha, and on the 21th days, Jesus shows up. <laughs> well, you know, the, you know, and he told him one thing. I'm now your master. And you know what it meant is in Buddhism. And he changed his life completely. But he could tell you amazing things Buddhist monks could do. Powers that they would have that would, that would make most pastors look like they don't know nothing about God, about, about the supernatural. These are powers. And they're gonna, we're going to see more of them in the last days because they are fighting, because they know their time is short, and we can't be ignorant to what's happening around us. Amen? Amen. Then we have the ranking uh, as one of the, it's the powers that was able to perform miracles. Remember when Moses made, uh, a, a, uh, he made a snake? You know what happened right there? They were not freaking out. They were not afraid when Moses, they just laughed. I mean, listen, this must have been, <laughs> this must have been African witch doctors. I remember being in the Caribbean islands. <laughs> I, I, had, I, had a, I had a four day crusade in, in St. Lucia in the Virgin Islands. And my God, it was, I mean, they were calling me the Black Benny Hinn. I love I didn't tell Pastor Benny Hinn, I must, I must tell him that. But they were calling me the Black Benny Hinn because I'd never seen those kind of miracles. They saw, they saw uh, them on television, but when I got there, they told me, we, we thought Benny Hinn was just, they, that couldn't be true. Then I went to the islands, you know, Benny Hinn was one of my mentors in terms of the healing ministry. And so we got, the pilot got locked on an entire island of 20,000 people. 20,000 of them were in the stadium with me. And um, uh, one of the nights, one of the women that got delivered and healed, was a, a woman that the Sangoma was using to divine through, and the man was making a lot of money. I mean, it was the book of Acts, Acts 16. And somebody snatched her from the compound, brought her to my crusade. I didn't even know about it, you know, and she got delivered, but he blamed me. You know, so following morning, that was a, he, following morning, I mean, this is a true story. Following morning, he did a, pre, a live TV press conference with TV cameras. I didn't know which doctors could do that. You know, and we had a pre live press conference and he told everybody, you know, this man from Africa, he messed with me last night. They didn't know what, I just wanted to come alive and said, today he's going to drop dead in the crusade. I'm sleeping at nine o'clock. I'm having fun There's by the ocean. I'm sleeping good. And I get a phone call from one of the pastors. I, get, I wake up, Reverend, are you work? I'm like, I must be now. If they said, oh, no, we, we, we have an emergency meeting right now. All the leaders of the Assemblies of God in the, in the island are meeting with other leaders. I said, what's up? It's not, it said, we have an emergency. One of the top witch doctors in, in the island, he is a very dangerous man in this island. Everybody's afraid of him. He, he just was live on television. Every news is cutting the story. It's live, right? I mean, they're, they're replaying what he said. And today you're going to drop dead. So I said, really? So, so, so what's the emergency? Well, we know none of us know where you come from Africa. <laughs> so we're afraid that if you drop dead, we don't know who's going to take your body. <laughs> This is a true story. And I'm like, pastor, so we are talking in your mind, I'm already dead. And you are figuring out who's gonna take my body back to Africa. I said, are you all together? I said, yes, we are all, all the bishops, are, we are here. I said, please put me on speakerphone. I was mad now, and I was awake. I said, can everybody hear me? Yes, they were, they were petrified. I said, guys, I'm an African. Maybe that may not mean anything to you. But let me educate you. I said, I want to just tell you this. First, number one, I want to indemnify you. I want to sign in, write any kind. I will indemnify you. If this witch is able to kill me, I will indemnify you. But we have a bigger problem. If I die to a pina colada sipping witch doctor in the islands who look like, who look like Bob Marley, I said, I'm going to enter heaven very depressed. I'll tell Jesus if a witch was going to tell me, was going to kill me, why didn't you give it to one of the African witches? At least I'll feel good about it. <laughs> I said to them, I said, guys, 
Whatever which doctor you think this guy is, if I took him to Africa right now, they'll put him in Sunday school of witchcraft. <laughs> but our father's at another level. They said, really? I said, I'm telling you. They won't even allow him to come in the conference. They'll check him out. They say, no, put him where the children are. The level of witchcraft in here, he can't even understand what they're talking about. I said, if those guys have failed to kill me, for me to come and guy in the island, I'll be very depressed. So, of course, they said, okay, are you sure? And that night he came. He came and there was more people. We had, we had, there was more people coming to see me die than coming to see the miracles. <laughs> the fact that I'm, I'm in Eswatini means he lost, he failed. <laughs> but the point I'm saying there, 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 there's real power, though, out there because of this powers level. But the one I want to focus on tonight is this ranking called uh, then there's the rulers of the darkness of this world. These are the rulers, these are the demonic principalities. That are, these are de fallen angels that operate behind philosophy, universities, all the ideologies we're fighting, they are behind that. But the one I'm most interested in is the one on spiritual wickedness in high places. That's the one we need to deal with because that's the one that deals with altars. Spiritual wickedness in high places, some translations, they change it to high places, but it's not true. The King James is the only one that's close to the truth. That's why in Hebrew, they understood a high place was, you see, a, a high place uh, to distinguish between the altars of the Lord and the many altars of evil in the land. They began to call them high places versus the altar of the Lord. So a high place was a place that was an altar that was built to a different deity other than Jehovah. So spiritual wickedness in high places is talking about these demonic entities that operate from altars. Africa understands altars. We, we grow around them. Talk to me, somebody. Don't know, you know amen? amen? Now, Americans are understanding altars because the truth, of, the truth of the matter, altars are everywhere. Even among the West, they are altars. Look at them, some of the mo movies coming out of Hollywood, and you know they are altars. Altars are everywhere because they are universal. They are ageless. You know, altars go, altars really define the story of the Bible. When I wrote my book, The Battle of Altars, I was blown away to find out that the word altar is mentioned two more times than the word prayer in the entire Bible. And that blew my mind because I'm a man who loves to pray, and I never researched that before until the Lord began to talk to me about writing on altars. And then we began to see mass regions. We began to see people uh, uh, delivered from altars and their behavior changes like that. You know, and so I thought maybe write the whole book on it. My friend Bishop Tudor Bismarck gave me an amazing glowing endorsement. And that book is available on our website. I think we have a copy tomorrow. We may be able to find a way you can get those books one or the other. Amen. So we want to deal with the subject of altars today. Today, God is going to destroy the altars that have been fighting you. Somebody ought to be happy about that. Amen. Amen. And so we're going to just follow that, that preamble of what, what altars are. I will define them. You know, I'll show you how to... Dis you have what they are, what they do, and how to destroy them. You know, because in the African culture, our understanding of altars is more being customary, traditional, because let's be honest, we grew up around them. I mean I, I mean, I grew up around them. I mean, I remember our fathers talking to us about certain days and what we had to do to honor the ancestors and different things. It's a big deal in Africa. You know, um, you see uh, 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 ancestral worship as a big deal in Africa. You know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a main driver behind the altars of Africa. But then there are, there are also other things. But the truth of the matter is that there are altars in Islam. You go in the Arabic world, my God, they are, they are believing. You go to the, to, the, to the Asians, my God, you see them with Buddha, different uh, uh, obelisks, Indians. Why are altars so perversive in the story of humanity? You must understand the story of the Bible to understand the story of altars. You know, and why the enemy replicated them or copied them because how many know Satan has no original idea? I said he has no original idea. He can't, he can, but, he can, but he's a master copycat. And a long time I found out something, that there's nothing wrong with being a copycat provided you copy the right cat. Yes. <laughs> and uh, amen. amen. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> I actually learned that principle the wrong way. The, I'll never forget that. I, I mean, one year I wanted to be a cool guy. I, was, I mean, I was being brainy, you know, you know, but I was very tired of just people looking at me in school as a, as a geek, you know, nobody. The women want, you know, we're not saved. The women wanted the, the bad boys. So one day I, I joined the bad boys. 
I want to, I want to look cool, you know. I didn't know what it was. I joined Bird Boys, you know, and, I, and I, it took me a long, to, a long while to discover that one reason why they were bad boys is because they couldn't read. <laughs> so I joined them, whatever, and for one semester I wasted my whole time, and then the exam came, and I had one of those fathers, if you bring back, I bring back a, 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 a wrong type of grade, you wouldn't even know what to do. You give the man of my father the report, you go to the guava tree, and you also bring your shambok. I mean, they, together, <laughs> because you know what's about to happen next. So I joined the, you know, he didn't know, but I joined the bad boys, okay? So when exam came, I realized, oh my God, I'm not ready for the first time, I'm not ready for an exam. So I sat next time to a guy, and I, I sat, I just, they, the scissors sat me next to a guy, and I was hoping he knew what he was doing. So I kept looking like this, and God set me up. When the result came, I don't even know how it happened. I was second to the last, and the one I was coping was number last. I don't know how that happened. <laughs> <laughs> but... That's when I realized you're going to be a copycat, copy the right cat. <laughs> well, God is like that. You know, God, you know, so enemy copies God and then, then reverse engineers what God is doing. So to understand a lot of what the Satan is doing and how to diffuse what he's doing, understand what God did. And then reverse engineer it back. Because all the devil is doing is reverse engineering what God did. Are you catch what I'm saying? When you understand altars from God's perspective, you can understand what to deal with the ones we find on the Father's house. The ones that are customary, the ones that are national. We begin to understand faith number one, why they are there, why the devil wants them there, why they are so perversive. But you've got to understand him from God's side. Amen? Because real authority doesn't come from reacting to the demonic. Real authority comes from reacting from the kingdom. Okay? So we're going to work from there. So I, I, I with me somebody. By the way, uh, in 1 Samuel chapter 5, 1, 2, 1, 1, 3, I want to tell you that what we call spiritual warfare is nothing short of the battle between two opposing altars from two different kingdoms. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 5, verse 1 to 4. 1 Samuel chapter, chapter what? 5, verse 1 to 4. If you look at it, you're going to find that this is when the ark of God, which is the, which is the altar of God, when the ark of God is taken by the Philistines, it, uh, it captured. It goes into the, uh, into the temple of Dagon. Dagon was a half fish. It was a, it was a half fish and half man uh, spirit, okay? It was a, it was a water spirit. He was also a land god. They thought he was a deity. So that's, that's who they worshipped eh, for the Philistines. So they took, they took the ark of God to the temple of Dagon. And they placed the ark of God next to the altar of Dagon, which was a big mistake. Because altars are going to fight. Okay? And when they woke up the following morning, Dagon was on the floor bowing before the Lord. And God said, take this picture for Facebook. Come on, somebody. Because, I mean, the, it, I mean there was nobody. But the, when they came out, Dagon was on the floor. When they pr tried to put back Dagon the following day, probably back again, God, the following day they came back. This time God said, okay, you didn't get the message. I'm going to break his legs. I'm going to break his legs. I'm going to break his hands. And he did it. My point is this. There was warfare between the altars even without the priesthoods. The point is this. That you need to know what, what we call spiritual warfare is really the battle between these two platforms. As a matter of fact, some of the people that see you for the first time and don't, don't like you, even though when you're smiling, don't take it personal. The altar in them is reacting to the altar of God in you. Amen. Have you ever just begun a job and you, you promise yourself, I'm going to be an angel to everybody, and you're just smiling for everybody, and you meet this girl, hello, I'm Cynthia. <laughs> what did I do? You're like, okay, I'm sorry. I mean, I mean and, and some don't even act, they just look like, I said, I'm Cynthia. What's going on, God? I'm just, it's my first day. I just want to be nice. Then don't get offended. It is because the altar in them is already reacting. That's why when the Pharisees got around Jesus, you know, there are different type of altars, even though they had rabbinical tradition, rabbinical, rabbinical clothing, because the altars in them would react very violently to Jesus. And that's why, you know, you're not of my father's kingdom, because I know the altar in you is different from mine. That's why every time you get around me, you want to fight me. You don't even know why, because what's in you is trying to fight me. I catch what I'm saying? You know, so when we talk about spiritual warfare, it really comes down to the battle of altars. That's what warfare, spiritual warfare is all about. And that's why when you begin to think that way, you know, now I'm going to answer the why. That is the basic element of spiritual warfare. It's really the battle of altars. As a matter of fact, if you want to transform nations, you have to understand that that's what it's about. In every nation, even America, that's why America, Washington, D.C. was built by Masons. You know why? Because they understand altars. You know, and I can show you, I can take you to Washington, D.C., and I can show you altars by Masons. They designed the city. 
around the altars they built. The issue of altars is a big deal. Satan is not going to give up on it, and we're going to find out why he doesn't. But when we understand that and we know how as believers, we can begin to take back the country, take back our bloodlines by understanding how to destroy these demonic platforms. Amen? That's why we are here today. Amen? Some of you would be further off in your career, in your life, except for the altars you're fighting. And I'm going to tell you how to recognize the presence of an evil altar in your bloodline. You know, I'm going to give you that as well. Amen? And then, and then we're going to end with break it, praying together because what's the point of talking about them if we can't break them? Yes. Amen? Yes. So we, we, we find that in the Bible that, you know, as a matter of fact, that's one of the reasons why when you come to Jesus, you say, so I say you know, when, I, when you come to Jesus, people say, I don't understand. Ever since I came to Jesus, it's like war has broken out. What is what's happening? Before you got born again, Dagon was in your heart. You get born again, the ark of God comes, now you have to clean out Dagon. You have to get out the altars in your bloodline, in your life. Okay, because it's like bringing the ark of the covenant in, amen? But what happens is because we have got, we have got uh, behavior patterns that are connected, through, are connected to our, our, our ancestral cultural traditions that are actually some of them are very geniusly waved into the culture of the supervising spirit of our tribe over the altar. We think it's our personality because that demonic entity has worked its work. It's been there for a long time. We are, oh, this is just what we do as, uh, as Bimbers. This is what we do as Zulus. This is what we do because it worked itself in it. So God really has to begin a work of cleansing us out by showing us that what we even call personality, much of it could be the influence of these altars. That's why sometimes we react, you know, that's why sometimes we react very negatively to truth. We don't even understand why we got so angry because the truth of the matter is the Pharisees got angry at Jesus because they said, why are you angry? Because I tell the truth. That's a litmus test. Because something in you, you may love the Lord, but something in you is reacting to what's coming from the Lord. And what has helped me in, in writing the book on the Battle of Otis was amazing for me. Because how many of God delivers the deliverer before he sends you out? I went through massive deliverance just identifying the altars of my father's house, writing the book. It went very deep. I would stop and begin to cry because I could begin to see the behavior of certain uncles and I could begin to see that pattern in my own life. I said, what I love. And then got to begin to, it was amazing. So it took a while to write because I would stop and get delivered first. Amen. But it's been beautiful to be, able to, see, to be able to see the freedom many people have found. Thousands of people email our ministry. You have no idea what you have done for me. This has happened. This happened. God delivered me. I got your book on altars. And my God, did God deliver my house. And I'm hoping the same thing for you today. But I believe that your destiny is just around the corner. I believe that many of you are about to enter realms of power and influence in, in, in Swatini. That you will be the new power brokers of this nation. Amen. Now, in Joshua, there's a story in Joshua chapter 3, verse 15 to 16. You know, uh, it's a very interesting story when the, the children of Israel are crossing over the Jordan. And as they're crossing over the Jordan, they are carrying the Ark of God, which is an altar. The Ark of God was the highest altar, mobile altar in Israel. When you saw that Ark, nations were afraid because they understood. I mean, see, at least the ancient world understood altars. Remember the Philistines, when they heard the sound of the children of Israel, they said, why are they screaming when we are, we are, when we are the one weaning against them? They said, well, because their priests are coming with the altar of the Lord. You know what the Philistines said to their credit? The Philistines understood that this battle they were in was not a battle of skill. It was a battle of altars because the general of the Philistines said, guys, forget that we have been winning. If those priests have a lifestyle to carry that ark, we are in trouble because we know the God that ark belongs to. There is no God. That's the, and he begins to testify. That is the God who destroyed Egypt. So the enemy begins to testify about the ark of the covenant. Can you imagine how surprised they were when they won that fight? They couldn't believe it because the priests who are carrying the ark of God were living in sin and compromise so the ark of God wouldn't work for them. They didn't have the lifestyle for what they were carrying. But they, that now we have a priesthood who have a lifestyle for what they're carrying. They are, take the altar, the altar of the Lord and they step in their feet in the water. Are you catching in the what? In the water. 
But there was something interesting in the, in the scripture. Maybe we, we can look at it. The scripture is very interesting scripture. It talks about that the water, once they step in it, the water, it says, let me read it. Joshua 3, verse 15, 16. As those who bore the ark came to the Jordan, and the feet of the priest who bore the ark dipped in the edge of the water, for the Jordan overflows all its banks during the whole time of harvest, that the waters which came down from upstream stood still and rose in a heap very far away at Adam. In other words, they stopped at Adam. Adam, that was, when I saw I was very born away. And God showed me something interesting. He said, the moment you and I begin to raise and build the altar of the Lord in our lives, in our church, guess what? That's the beginning of reversing the power of national altars, regional altars, and blood and altars, because the altar of the Lord, as we raise it, it begins to push back the waters of iniquity back to Adam. Amen. Talk to me, somebody. To begin to reverse all of that. How many are ready for a reversal? Talk to me, somebody. Amen. To begin to see. Amen. I am here to tell you that iniquities, behavior patterns, cycles of, of failure and defeat that, are, that, that, that plagued your fathers, your mothers, are not going to touch you. You are going to be the one that escapes to do mighty and good things for the kingdom of God. Somebody, somebody ought to give God a shout if you believe that. Yeah. Amen. Turn to your neighbor and tell them everything is shifting tonight. Now, there are two types of altars very quickly. Again, I'm just giving you a phone. So there are two types of altars. Before we define the altar, uh, I want to give you, there are two primary class of altars, and we find this in Genesis chapter 4, in the story of the children of, in the children of Adam, uh, Cain and Abel. The Bible says that, uh, that they, uh, if you read from verse 3, that in the place of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. And also, uh, and Babel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry and his countenance failed. So the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door and its desire is for you, but you shall rule over it. Now Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against what? Abel, his brother, and killed him. Right in this story, we find the two types of altars in the Bible. We are still dealing with these two types of altars in any bloodline, any family, any nation, any region. You are always going to find until the consummation of this age of, age of men, this may be a phenomenon men deal with, okay? Um, so what happens is two brothers build altars, okay? We know they build altars because you know how you sacrifice to God. There would always be an altar because it was a time, uh, scholars said it was a time of Yom Kippur. You know, I don't know, you know and it's, 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 very, it's very clear that God told Adam and Eve how to teach their children the laws of atonement, Okay? They must have known because when Adam and Eve were living in the Garden of Eden, God put a what? Animal skin around them. That means they were bloody when they left. So they already knew blood is the way you deal with sin. This was the time of Yom Kippur. And so these two boys raised two altars. You see that? Side by side. The difference is what they put on the altar. Okay? On the altar of Abel, he put the first flock, the best he could find, because that's what God needed. Because without the shedding of blood, there would be no what? Remission of sin. So he, Abel, built a righteous altar. He offered, the Bible says, a more excellent sacrifice to God. But what did Cain do? Cain took the fruit of the ground. This would tell us the difference between the evil altar and the, unrighteous, and the righteous altar. Okay, I'll define it right here. So he put the fruits of the ground because he was a farmer. Okay, God is not against farming. This is not the story of God is against farming. But God cannot use vegetables to redeem. Talk to me, somebody, because vegetables don't bleed. Is that right? Not only that, vegetables, the vegetables came from the ground that had already been cursed in chapter 3. So what is the difference between the evil altar and the righteous altar? The righteous altar is an altar that's built to worship God, to worship God, in, watch, to worship God in the way he desires and is prescribed to be approached in Scripture. 
The Eva altar, amen, is an altar that, that is designed to bring alive the accursed thing. So that's what Abel. So God, but immediately you, you, you notice who killed one. So you say that the one with the evil altar went after. Again, right there we see the battle of altars. It's always going to be like that. Okay? So we see two, two different types of altars. Righteous altars and evil altars. It is the evil altars that are, are destroying our nations. It is the evil altars. And by the way, we, we, our, let, let's be honest. Okay? How many know that you have not always been, if you're like me, you got born again. At a, I got born again when I was 18. Some of you may be 20. But here's the point. You are not born, born again. You may remember that. That means the chances that when you're born again, you did know God are very much higher. That means the first altars you are introduced to could not be divine. They were shrines to ancestors, to different deities. Why? Because unless you are born again, you don't know the difference. I got what I'm saying. My father, who loved me with everything he got, when even as a Catholic, before he got born again, when we go to the village, he would do all the rituals. Because his mother, I mean, we would go there and we would be following our dad before rituals of the ancestors in Zambia. This is the African story. Then go back and we're back in Catholic church. We did not see anything wrong because when you are not born again, you are blind. That means the, the, the first altars that get access to you are evil altars before you turn to the Lord. I got you what I'm saying. Okay? But the purpose of the evil altar is to give life to the accursed thing. I get you what I'm saying. Take, take ancestral worship, for instance. It's bringing life to the accursed. What is a curse? God said, there shall be no one who talks to the dead. So that's accursed. But when you go to an altar that, that venerates ancestors, no matter how much, there's nothing wrong with having them in memory. It's another thing when you venerate them in, because earth is the land of the living, not the dead. So you're giving life to the accursed thing. And people differ for different things. There are altars of witchcraft, different things people do it for. So these two types of altars are very prevalent in the Bible. But we see, but why would Satan replicate? Why would Satan copy God? Why? Well, that leads us to why altars, okay? We now go, I want you to go to the book of, um, this is very interesting, you know, because I, I, want, I want you to understand this because when you understand, you understand this, this will help you a lot. So first and foremost, let's go to the book of Genesis 28, verse 11 to, to 8, just write it down, and then I'm going to define an altar for you. I want to make sure it's on video because they're telling me they're recording this. You might want it for posterity or whatever, you know, so you can have it. And then I'm going to define, but I'm going to define, I'm going to use the scripture to define what, what is an altar. Then I'm going to tell you why altars, and then we're going to begin to look at quickly through the 12 laws of the altar. I'm going to just give you bullet points. The whole reason of doing that is because when we stand up to pray, amen, you, will be, you are going to have a point of reference for how we destroy these altars. Amen. Because remember, all the devil did is reverse engineer what God established, so when you know that, you can do it on him. Amen. You can give the devil the test of his own medicine. So it's, it, it, Genesis 28, very quickly, verse 11 to 18, it says this, very interesting, this is Jacob, son, of, son of, uh, of, of, of Isaac, you know, running from Esau, and here's what happens, verse 11. That is Genesis 28, verse 11. So he came to a certain place and stayed there all night because the sun had set, and he took one of the stones of that place and put it at his head. And he lay down in that place to sleep. Now, then he dreamed, and behold, a ladder was... Now, if you actually read this, verse 10, it tells you the place. It was a, it was a place called Luz. The, the city where he came is the place where in Genesis 12, verse 7, Abraham, his father, his grandfather, built an altar to the Lord. And God appeared to Abraham and promised that I'm going to give you this land. So here's the thing about altars. Unless they are destroyed, the people that raise the altars may die, but the altars live on. This is true for righteous altars and for evil altars. Now, for righteous altars, we want them to live on. That's why we want to build legacy for you. We want to live righteous. Talk to me, somebody, man. 
But there's also evil altars. The, the people who raise them may die, but the altars remain, I mean, remain influencing the people that are left within the bloodline unless they are destroyed. They'll keep speaking. Amen. And today we are going to pray. We are going to come against those evil altars that are still speaking in your life and interrupting the flow of destiny in your life. Amen. Amen. So here Jacob has come by divine providence. He had no GPS. And when a man is afraid of being killed and is just running, trust me, he's, not, he's just running. Everything he hears behind him, he runs further because he thinks it's Esau getting close. So the fact that he ends up at the very place where Abraham, his grandfather, built an altar is divine providence. What is interesting, that all this way, he's running, God will not talk to him. I'm going to show you God will not talk to a man who is not standing on an altar. This is true. <laughs> okay, so God waits. God waits to instruct him until he can come to a legal place God can actually talk to him over. I'm going to show you how altars enable spirits to connect with men on legal grounds. And God being a spirit will not violate his own ethos. So he had to wait. All this while the boy was running, God would not talk to him. But by divine providence, God just led him to where he could talk to him. So he arrived at the same place where there was an altar built by his grandfather. Amen. And that altar was in need of a new attendant who carried the same DNA. Evil altars operate at the same premise. When the one who raised them dies and he was a witch, they begin to speak to somebody until one body in that bloodline rises to save the altar. Ah. That's why you find you've got a teenager. I don't understand. Why do I keep having the dream? And she's dreaming about an auntie who's long dead who used to be a witch. The altar is trying to call her to attend. Yes. If you don't deal with it, that altar will keep stronger and stronger because it's calling for somebody with the same DNA to attend. So God knows that the altar Abraham built is still alive. It just needs an attendant of the same DNA and the same calling. And he bumps into it. And here's what happens. Look at verse 12. Then he dreamed and behold, a ladder was set up on the earth and its top reached to heaven. And there the angels of God were ascending and, this, were ascending, and ascending on it. They are what? Ascending and descending on it. Whoa, what? The angels were ascending. That means they were already there. They did not, if they were descending, they were reacting to his arrival. If they were ascending, he bumped into them because they were around the altar Abraham built. They were ascending and descending. Talk to me somebody, amen? amen. They were ascending and, what, and descending. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, your, and the God of Isaac, the land on which you lie, I will give to you, uh, I will give to you and your what? Descendants. Also your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the west and the east, to the north and to the south. And in you and all your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Notice the altar is speaking the same thing that was spoken to God to Abraham because the altar maintains the same language. Behold, I am with you and will keep you in all, in whatever you do, wherever you go, and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I've spoken to you. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep, watch, and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God and the gate of heaven which every definition of an altar is right here. And Jacob arose early in the morning, took the stone that he had put at his head, set as a pillar, and poured oil on it. Because I want to remember, okay? So what is an altar? Write it down, or at least have it on the tape very quickly. Amen? I'm going to give you the definition of an altar. What is an altar? Amen? Are you ready? I'm going to give you this definition of an altar because I want you to have it. Amen? I want to make sure that it's in your books so that you do never forget what an altar is. An altar is a supernatural landing strip. An altar is a what? Supernatural landing strip, comma, a power station, 
comma, a consecrated place, a place of exchange, a place of sacrifice, a table of fellowship. By the way, in Hebrew, the Hebrew word for altar is also the Hebrew word for table. So when you are invited to an altar, it's like being invited to eat whatever the altar provides to those who attend. A place of covenant, a place where covenants are made and sustained. Period. It's a spiritual platform where spirits, God, angels, or demons land. It's where humanity meets with divinity. So in the, every altar, whether it's demonic or divine, fits that configuration. Altars are placed at the, altars literally act like gates between the world of men and the world of spirit. Okay, they allow men and spirit to engage each other on legal grounds. Why? Because in Genesis 1, because in Genesis 1.26, in Genesis what? 1.26, God did something that established what is known as the law of dominion and territory. The law of dominion and territory is found in this passage when God said, let us make man after what? Our image after our life and let them have what? Dominion. Everybody said, let them have what? Dominion, and then he said, then he, then he defined the them when he said, let them, male and what? Female. So male and female, let them have what? Dominion. That means that dominion on earth belongs to spirits living in bodies of dirt and defined by two genders, male and what? Female. Now, because God said, let them have dominion, it means, the word dominion comes from the Hebrew word mamlakra, which means to be in charge, to be in, to be what? In charge. That means when it comes to the earth, God put man in what? In charge. God made man a sovereign. What does that mean? It means God, therefore, by the law of his own word, can't break the law he has now established. Because a king who can break his own word is not a king worth having. So once God decide, decides something, he becomes subject to what he said. Are you catching what I'm saying? So he makes earth the world of men. Say with me, earth, earth. is the world, the world. of men. So if earth is the world of men, any spirit, including God, that wants to do business in the earth has to, has to, what? Has to secure the cooperation of a man. That's why, that's why because of that, and so God gave man, Adam, he gave them the knowledge of how to build an entity. He, he, he gave them, here's how you do. So altars now become, become what? legal points of entry, but only men can build them because the altars are about men inviting the influence of spirits in the world of men. So God says, because you are the one who wants me in your world to bring power into your world, talk to me somebody, you're gonna have to build the altar. So the, every altar in the Bible is raised by men and every evil altar in the Bible was raised by men. So if altars are raised by men, they can be destroyed by men. Come on somebody, amen? I catch what I'm saying. If altars are raised by men, they can be destroyed by men. And I'm here to tell you, you are that man for your family. Yes. Amen. Yes. Hello, Gideon. Amen. I want to deliver Israel, but there's an evil altar in your father's house. Your father is, you say, Gideon, come. The angel appears to Gideon, and Gideon is so excited because of that encounter with God. He sees God face to face, and then he builds an altar to the Lord. He builds what? And he calls the altar uh, Jehovah, Shalom, Jehovah is Shalom. That means the altar, he called the altar the Lord is peace. Now why is that important? The altar of peace, the, the first altar you build, every, you cannot go after evil altars in your bloodline unless you are standing, unless the, you are standing on the altar of the Lord. Otherwise they will eat you for breakfast. So the first altar that must happen is that you must belong to God. So the altar of, of of peace, that the order, the first order he built is, is equivalent to salvation. What is the first thing Jesus gives you when you get born again? Peace. Ever since I received the Lord, I got what? That's the first altar. When, when you are standing on that altar, when peace is now in your heart, because the Prince of Peace is living in your heart, now he can use you to go after the altars of your father's house that are stopping destiny and power uh, in your life. Are you catching what I'm saying? So God, the angel of the Lord, comes to Gideon the, first, the very first night. And I believe God raises a Gideon for every family. And you are here today because you are the Gideon for your bloodline. Amen? Amen? 
And so God, the angel of the Lord comes to Gideon and said, Gideon, uh, you are, uh, it's great you built me the first altar. I want you to build me a second altar. But this one, you are going to first destroy the altar of Baal that your father has built. That's Judges chapter 6. And when Gideon destroys that altar, his destiny is released in the very following chapter. Destiny is released. I believe when we destroy these evil altars tonight, you're going to begin to see your business go to another dimension. You're going to begin to see your children begin to act differently. Talk to me, somebody. Amen? Because what is... Amen? Hallelujah. You know, and uh, it's, 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 it's very, very powerful. So, when God says the Genesis 1.26 is why altars became necessary, because God cannot intervene in the world of men without asking for the permission of a human being to join. It's not that God is not sovereign. God is sovereign, but in his sovereignty, he chose to work through men. Are you getting what I'm saying? God in his what? Sovereignty chose to work through men. Honey, can I have the tower, please? Now, very, very quickly, amen. So Satan is a copycat because if, if God was a spirit, cannot enter the world of men without finding a man to raise him an altar. Is that right? Then Satan looked at that. He realized, okay, that's how he's getting in. He has found the cooperation of a man. The only problem for the devil, there was only two men. One was female, one was male. And he kept watching. Talk to me, somebody. Amen. <laughs> he saw how Adam began to pray in tongues when he saw her. He realized, oh my God, if I go to Eve, I'm like, so Satan came for one of them. She came to talk to the woman, but she was a man. So she had legal right to engage a spirit. That's why he talked to her. Adam could have stopped it, but he was right there. Okay. What is the bottom line? As soon as they engaged, as soon as, I, I mean, as soon as they reacted to, to the suggestion of the, of the serpent, they came into a place of agreement. Altars are places of agreement. There was, whether you like it or not, there was an agreement that was made the moment Eve, Adam and Eve took of the tree. An agreement had been made between them and the other snake. So now he had the legal right to build his altars in the world of men. He got one, and as men began to multiply, he got a lot more. Are you catching what I'm saying? And evil altars are easy to build because they appeal to our sensual nature. And so we, before you know it, in two generations, there were altars all over the land. And the whole Bible became, the, became about fighting the fight between the righteous altars of the Lord and the evil altars being built by men to Molech, uh, uh, Baal, Ashtoreth, you, uh, I mean Zeus. Oh man, you can continue different deities under different name, Buddha, whatever you want to call it. As a matter of fact, the story of Israel is the story of the church. Because Israel is always a prophetic picture of the church. The story of Israel is the story of what happened and when Israel was, with, was building righteous altars and what happened when Israel backslid and they began to build altars to other gods. That's the whole story of the Bible. So Israel was either under a righteous priest, you know, with, Israel would have a revival because they, were built, they, was, they tore down, notice every revival in Israel had involved, always involved one thing. That means revival is not revival if you are excited by the altars that are still standing. So real revival is going to put a supernatural um, anger in you, a righteous anger, to want to see every evil altar in your bloodline or your nation come down. Amen. Because it is the source of the demonic influence in the family or the family. You can't live it because it's a power station for iniquity. It must be shut down. Amen. Amen? And by the grace of God, we are about to do it in a few minutes. I'm going to have everybody stand. Trust me, I'll be done at eight. Amen. Come on, somebody. Amen. Amen. So what I want to do for you now is because we are about to go, we are, we are, we are going to, because we are going to uh, destroy these altars, I'm going to give you statements. Now, in my book, The Battle of Otters, which you can buy on Amazon, we, can, we have books in South Africa. We can always ship them from South Africa where, where they are to this place. I'll, I'll work with the man of God. Tomorrow, the, we have a graphic. You can see the books I have. You can all, we, we have a way for you to get the books if you need them and how to get them to the man of God. 
But I want to just give you, uh, because this is a Bible study type of thing, because I want you to, I want you to get this information. I'm just, I'm not going to expand on it. I'll just give you the 12 laws of an altar. Every altar has 12 laws. If you, or every Sangoma follows those 12 laws. Every priest in Israel follows those 12 laws. Why? Satan has not deviated from what God built. He's only using it to his own advantage. So let's quickly look at the 12 laws of the altar. And maybe, yeah, we can just use the PowerPoint for that. Number one, law of the altar, write it down. It will be showing up on your PowerPoint. All altars have a dedicated human attendant. Say with me, all altars have a dedicated what? Human what? Attendant. That means the most important uh, feature of an altar is the human who attends to the altar. So when you are, so now I'm going to show you how we, now remember what you're going to do. So, so how do you destroy the altars in your bloodline? You reverse engineer these laws. So when I come to pray, so here's how I pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, as a priest, I'm praying right now that you shut down anybody in my bloodline who's attending to an altar that does not belong to Jesus. You see, Amen. now you are reverse engineering because for altars in your bloodline to survive, altars are powerless without a human attendant. Watch this. I said altars are what? Powerless. Without a human attendant. They go dark until an attendant rises. That's why you see in our rituals, when, 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 if your mother was a, was a priestess in our rituals, let's be honest, before we go, we know what I'm talking about. We, if, if they know she's about to pass, Satan made sure that within the culture, he has a replacement ritual. Yes. So they said, oh, come here. What? Your mother has chosen you. Chosen me? Yes. <laughs> chosen me? Yeah. She's the one, she says you are the one who's most like her. So we want to prepare you for the rituals. She's about to go, but she wants you to go to another level. I saw this in my own eyes. Unsuspecting girls became witches overnight. Didn't even know it. Because they just wanted to honor their grandmother who chose them above everybody. <laughs> so the devil knew the attendant is about to die. I better get a replacement before they die. Because the altars, whether they are righteous altars or evil altars, go dark if there's no human attendant. So that's how I do it. When I break altars for people, I reverse this. Everybody in your family who's attending to an altar, Lord, shut them down. Amen. Law number two. All altars have a guiding or supervising spirit. Say with me. All altars have a guiding or supervising what? Now, if your altar you have built is a righteous altar, like if you build an altar to the Lord in your house, guess the Lord himself becomes the supervising spirit to the altar in your home. That's why it's important to build an altar in your home. Okay? But if the altar is, a, 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 is not a, a righteous altar, and by the way, amen? Talk to me somebody, amen? amen. Where if the altar is not a righteous altar, then the, the spirit behind it cannot be the Holy Spirit. It's going to be a divination spirit, witchcraft. You know, it could be perversion. It could be, you never know. It could be drunkenness. Everybody in your family has to attend to that altar. They drink away their servings. They drink themselves to death. They, I mean, it's a cycle. Their families like that. That's an altar. I'm going to show you, you know, my, all altars have a guiding or supervising spirit. For, for Gideon's family, the supervising or guiding spirit was Baal. And God called him out. Go and destroy the altar of Baal. Because God is saying that is a supervising spirit behind your family. You cannot go and destroy the Midianites until you deal with the altar of Baal. Why? Because you cannot destroy an enemy who's using the same power you are using. You see, the, the Midianites were worshippers of Baal. So was Gideon's father. So God says, you can go and have that. Deal with it here, then you'll be able to overcome it out there. Amen? So number three, all altars, all altars are powered by the sacrifices of the human attendant who services the altar. All altars are what? Powered by the what? Of the human attendant who services what? The altar. So guess what I do? Oh, by the way, if we go, if we, the law that was before us was 
All altars, let's go back. All altars are what? Have a supervising what? Just go back. So when I'm praying, guess what I do? Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I bind and I ask for you, God, to release a restraining order against a supervising spirit bind this evil altar in my family. Amen. See, every of these laws can be reverse engineered in prayer. Just reverse engineer it and you will see altars begin to let you go because they have no choice but to obey the same laws. So number three, or altars are powered by the what? Sacrifice of the human attendant. So what, what, what do I do? I say, Lord, I ask you, by the blood of Jesus, Lord, I ask you to notify all the sacrifices, the altars in my family were given by my ancestors because they are surviving by those sacrifices. You pray against that. You are turning them around. Okay? Number four. All altars, all, 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 amen, all, and all attendants to an altar are fed by or provided for by the altar they serve. This is a big one. Why do you think, uh, uh, I mean, all altars, this, every altar, every priest to an altar, whether a righteous altar, even the Sangomas, they eat from the altar they, they service. But it's a kingdom principle. Paul told, talks about it. Don't you know that they that save at the altar eat from the altar? 1 Corinthians 9 verse 13. Why am I saying this? I tell people, this is a huge one. I tell people, God told me, he says, Francis, if you can build me an altar in your home, I'll promise you I'll pay the bills of the house. Yeah. I don't have time to teach you that, but I have people who have told me they canceled their debts when they heard me teach on altars in your home to pay off bed. It's phenomenal. I even tell people, when your bills in the month come, if you're a righteous priest, I mean, no, your calling as a child of God is not to be a Christian. God didn't call Christians. God called you to be a priest. The problem with just being a Christian is a general label. It's a, it's, it's a label without, it's a label without a proper definition. Because when you say Christian, it means so many things to a thousand people. But when I say priest, it brings down to one thing. Someone say, I'm a priest. I'm a priest. And the number one work of a priest is to attend to the altar. And if you attend to the altar, God says, I'll feed you. Listen, if witchcraft did not have benefits, there'll be no witches. The devil takes care of them too. I got what I'm saying? They go at the altars and they do their rituals. They chant, they dance, whatever they do. They are. Come on, somebody. The following day, amen, amen. The following day, their competitor dies and they take the business for half the price. Oh, that's the devil. The devil was provided. Otherwise, witchcraft would be boring if the devil didn't bless them. <laughs> Come on, somebody. <laughs> Amen? So I, so I say, Lord, I'm asking you to shut down every provision anybody in my family who says an evil altar is receiving from it. Shut it down. You know how we can shut it down? Because in the, Elijah was able to shut down that, he was able to shut down Baal on Mount Carmel. They were doing their sacrifices. They cut themselves. And he says, keep on talking. Maybe he's sleeping. He shut them down. You could do it. Can we do it tonight? Yes. Number five. When I finish the laws, we're going to stand up and pray. Oh, oh, uh, number five. We went too far. One more back. Oh, altar. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Some, okay. Number six. All altars are places of what? Ritual. Someone say what? This is the, the biggest one when I'm doing deliverance. I help people to discern what kind of altar you're dealing with. Look at the rituals you are dealing with. What's a ritual? A ritual is a repetitive activity. Something that keeps happening. A pattern. That's what the ritual is. You get what I'm saying? So if you're always, if you lose money once, it might be human error. Maybe twice, but it keeps happening. A pattern develops. When there's a pattern, don't dismiss it because an altar could be revealing itself. I mean, there's always, you know, 
Autumn of depression. You are, you are depressed. I mean, you are happy two days, and the, the next five days, you are, you, you, you are like you have been soaking lemon juice, and then you are, you, are, you, are, you are happy. You see the pattern continues, and altar is involved, and you need to know that the ritual, is, if the ritual is not divine, if the ritual is not divine, does not uh, uh, revolve around the fruit of the Holy Spirit, love, peace, whatever, it's an evil altar, and you have the legal right as a child of God to say, Lord, I'm going to shut this thing down because this is not my portion in the Lord. Number, number seven, amen? Okay. Amen? I think some, some of the laws were numbered several times, but all altars what? Speak. All altars what? Speaks. Okay? We find that. Okay? As a matter of fact, the scripture, all altars what? Speak. You know, how do they speak? The altars speak through the voice of the supervising spirit. So if an altar you're attending is the altar of the Lord, then hello, Samuel, Samuel's sleeping, but you slept before the altar of the Lord. Then he has a voice until, Simon, until Eli figures out the Lord is talking to you because the Lord was a, a supervising spirit behind the altar he was sleeping at because he slept before the Lord, the sombre boy Samuel. But if it's an evil altar, that's why you can see in dreams, you know, people being caught to do things. You know, all altars speak, okay? And we are, so when we Pray against them. We say, Lord, we want to silence every evil altar that is speaking or calling me to attend to it in Jesus' name. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna pray that. Okay? Next one. All altars are places of what? Exchange. You know, that's why it, actually when you get born again, you come to the altar. Where you, you come what? To the altar because you know something, you know this is a place of what? Exchange. You can come here and exchange your sins for the righteousness of God. You that was the, come to the what? Come to the what? Why do we say that? Because the altar is a place of exchange. It's the only place you can exchange with the spirit. Okay? So what I do I do? We are going to ask God to, to shut down every demonic exchange happening in your life that's not God. And replace it with the exchanges of the Lord, where you now begin to have divine encounter, have the divine encounter. Those are the exchanges you need. In Jesus' name, amen? amen? The next one. All altars are places of what? Covenant. Okay? This is why the altars are so strong in our, our culture in Africa, because of the covenants our forefathers make with these deities. They make very strong covenants. That's why, that, you know, I mean, very strong covenants. You know, I remember before God born again, they, them telling us, you, you don't do this. You, I, mean, I mean, it was a really an adventure. I did not know God was preparing me for my ministry, just living in Africa. You know, where every time we, I, I love the holidays, but I go and see grandmother. She lived in the village, you know, coming from the city. I don't know why it was exciting to me, but I like to go. You know, but when you get there, they would be telling you the stories of the agreements. You know, we, you know, you have to know. You know, remember one time, you know, this uncle, this auntie telling me, you know, we have got two, we have got two ancestries. You need to know, you are the firstborn son. Uh huh. I just want to go and play. Uh huh. He said, you know, but she freaked me out. She said. On your father's side, we are the lion people. On your mother's side, we are the snake, snake people. <laughs> they say, oh, no, don't worry. They, they, they don't do us some. They know us. They are part of our family. Ah, I'm like, my God, get me back to the city. Snakes are part of our family? Because <laughs> they said on my mother's side, we are the snake people. You know? No wonder why you start. No wonder why I was. Is this surprising? That many times when I was having nightmares, it was snakes in my dreams. Eh? I'm sure the snake people are like, why are, you, why are you running away from us? <laughs> but I'm telling you, it could have agreements that have been made. Today as we pray, the blood of Jesus is going to break those agreements. Amen. Amen? amen? Every covenant that has been made, amen? amen. Covenants that have been made. And, the, and, and the interesting, the people that made them are long gone, but the covenant is sustained until a Gideon rises. Amen. Until a Gideon rises Amen. and says, "Is enough is enough, you are getting out of our family. Yes. Amen? Yes. That's why you are here tonight. The next one. Amen? What's the next one? All altars can hear. All altars what? What is it? They know why? They can hear through the supervising spirit. You know, that's why you can go to an altar and speak and things begin to happen. You can go to an altar and pray and then answers begin to come. 
because the, or the, ears of the, the ears of the altar are the ears of the supervising spirit. So whatever Elijah did, it completely shut down the ability for Baal to hear those priests, 450 of them, cutting themselves. That's a lot of blood on the ground and did nothing happen. So we know that we are able to silence the evil altars. And I'm praying that God is going to raise men and women with an Elijah anointing in this church and this is region who are going to talk to me, somebody, amen? who are going to deliver to God a new eswatini, full of prosperity, where evil altars are being silenced region after region because God is raising you. But guys, we can't deal with the original altars if we can't deal with the altars in the Father's house. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. And so on the very least, let's deal with the altars of the Father's house because then we'll be empowered to begin to deal with regional altars as the corporate body. Amen? Okay, next one is, Amen? All altars either have God or an idol, a demon God that is worshipped at the altar. You know, so when you destroy an altar, you disempower the idol who operates from the altar. You know? Because we only want God in our lives. Are you with me, somebody? Amen? What's the next law? There are more than that. Okay. All right. So I'll give you some... some, some uh, some other, write two more that are not on there, on that list. Amen. I'm just going to say it for you because I want them to be on the recording. Amen. Spiritual warfare, law number, spiritual warfare is a result of two opposing altars standing side by side, and you already know that. Okay. This is a good one. Okay. Because you can descend your warfare. When you begin to have too much warfare, this is always where I go. What altar am I fighting right now? What is rising? What is in the environment? It's a powerful way of dealing with these things. You know? And, uh, uh, and then lastly, whoever carries the superior altar takes the day. Whoever carries the what? The superior altar takes the day. I would really believe that today, because I really believe that the reason you are here is because what God has been doing in your life, every time you have been in Bible study, you have been in these meetings, what you don't understand is that the author of God in your life has becoming stronger and stronger and strong. And tonight, the Lord is telling you, you are the Gideon, you are ready to deal with the altars of your father's house. Amen. You are well able, talk to me somebody, amen. You are well able to bring down the altars of your what? Father's house. I cannot tell you the breakthrough that will come. I'll just give you a very quick testimony, and then I'm going to pray. I'm going to ask everybody to stand up. We're going to pray in tongues together, and then I'm going to lead you in some powerful prayers before the Lord to break these evil altars. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. I am telling you, my ministry is a ministry with miraculous attestations. It never fails. I'm telling you what I'm here. Even by tomorrow morning, you're going to be getting phone calls you've been waiting on, things shifting. Talk to me, somebody. Promotions denied to become promotions released. I'm telling you what's going to begin to happen. Amen. There are infirmities. There are infirmities. Some of you have been fighting. Are you catching what I'm saying? Some of those infirmities are being generated by the altars in your bloodline. You deal with the altars, the body is going to shift. Amen. You woke up, you woke up oh, what's up? Mark, I don't feel that pain anymore. Because last night, tonight, you got delivered. You have no idea what, see, there's more happening in the realm of spirit when you deal with this than you can see. Sometimes when God opens your eyes, you're like, what is going on? Is this what's going, what's, what's going on? But I can tell you as somebody who has been used by God in this arena, my God, I'm getting ready. I'm excited about being here tonight. You know? God does not bring me to a region unless he's, he's about to do something big. The reason is very simple. I'm not accepting every invitation. I mean, that sin of my life where I say, we're saying a whole lot knows. Sometimes it hurts to say no because people want you to be all over the world. But I'm in a season where I must pray. I must feel a connection. I must feel. And I'm telling you, you know, when your pastor, when I met him in Zimbabwe, we connected, and when he emailed me or texted me on WhatsApp, I felt I needed to go. This was my time. I always knew I'd come to uh, Eswatini. Used, you know, I always knew that when I used to live in South Africa, but I knew it was coming. When he sent me that email, I felt the Lord said, you need to go. So I've been sent by God, and to the man who has been sent by God, to whom to him is given the spirit without measure. 
So get ready to see deliverance in your life. But I want to give you a very uh, quick story, and then I'm going to have everybody stand up. Because I want you to understand, when I'm talking about altars, they're very personal to me. Okay? You know, for 29 years, our family fought an altar is that when my father, that this altar was a, was a stronghold in our bloodline. I didn't, but I, you know, some, but, but I had no understanding of altars as I do now. I knew them in culture, but I did not fully understand them. I knew them in our customs. I never really understood the, the, the dynamicness of them in the realm of spirit once you get, become born again. But I saw a pattern, and the, I saw a pattern in my father first. My father was a brilliant man in business. He could gather things. And then just when you, you think he's about to become one of Zambian's millionaires, things would happen. Weird things would happen. And before you know it, my sister, it would be scattering of resources. There would be different things, accidents. Whatever it was, the cumulative effect was what was built was lost. My father, because he was such a provider, he, he, this man, would, he, he, he knew he had no luxury to, when you have got 10 children, you have no luxury to cry. You get back at it. You have no luxury to cry. <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs> because your tears don't disappear, those 10 children. Amen. <laughs> they are still there. <laughs> he went in again, different things. And he, and he would build, I mean, he would have favor, things would happen. People would celebrate him, you know, and then things would collapse. This pattern was amazing. The last time it happened, I'll never forget. We moved to a city called Indola. You know it because you were born in Zambia past. Indola, he had a house. He was, we went to Indola because my father was poached by, was being poached by um, Italians. Uh, what is the company? This Shell. This Shell. I think Shell. This uh, gas company. They were poaching him. For six months, he was saying no. He didn't want to leave his job. He was the best that he never stole a dime in his life. You know, so the reputation, the reputation went around about him. And so they came. They said, no. He said, he, said, I, he said, I don't know nothing about oil. He said, no, 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 no. We just want you to be over the finals. <laughs> For six months, finally gave in. They gave him an offer he could not refuse. And so we moved. We moved, he was going to be the vice president of Shell in Dollar, big thing, because that's where the oil refinery was. So we moved in this big house. We probably stayed in this house three weeks when my father came back to my mother with a face that said we're in trouble again. This, oh, the white man who had been going after him for six months came to his office with his, his face looking just said, said, Daniel, I don't know what to tell you. I am so, I've never been more embarrassed in my life. So why? He said, my head bosses who outranked me in Italy want to send an Italian that they promised in your job. I begged. I told them, I've been after this guy. We, and he's doing an amazing job. But they wouldn't listen. So you have to go. Wow. We have to go. You came after me for six months. Again, there was. My mother who saw the person, oh, my, here we go again. Here we go again. So we, fortunately for my, for my father, he had a house three bedroom house, we, smaller, we could move in that he had put on rent. That's the problem of being a renter in Africa. You can be expelled any time. <laughs> so we had bad news. So we, we, so we gave our renter bad news. You are leaving, I'm sorry, whatever. So we moved into a small house, but he still had money because he had, he had invested, he had, now this time he had, he had main buses, so he had several, about five buses, so at least I can manage the buses, they'll still help me out even though I've lost this job. With all that came with it, let's do this. So we moved into this house. My father became sick. Because he, he became sick, he couldn't handle his business, so he asked his brothers to handle it. Within about six months, every bus was gone. Wow. An accident, this happened, and in six months, my father was completely broke, and then for the first time, broken. I remember one time when my father called us in a family, family of, he said, sit down now, much older. He brought us in his house. The first and only time I ever saw my father cry, and he cried. And then he said, my children, I don't know what to do, and he used these words. But in order for us to survive, I'm going to have to scatter you. I did not know then, out of his own mouth, 
The name of the altar was being mentioned. The scatterer. I didn't know what it was. I had no idea, but, but it remained with me. And this proud man who always had his family together, I was thrown to, I was sent to live with an alcoholic uncle I didn't even know. My sister was, my sister was, was in high school, was sent to live with the next door neighbor so she could finish. I mean, it was scattering. And then my father went to the village to start over. From town to, he was, I never seen anything like it. God knows this, he got born again in the village. It's a long story, he, got, he recovered and, and he died. And God, he recovered most of the things through being born again is a beautiful thing. He recovered most of the things. But I saw the same pattern in my life when I came to Christ in America, doing big things. Then the scattering would be, I said, what is this? Story short. One day, I'm working on altars. Now I'm beginning to understand this, what altars do, how they work in human, how they break people down, how they can, whatever, I'm going through this, writing this. Then I hear the voice of the Holy Spirit, Francis, go into your home altar, because every house we built at my house, we built an altar to the Lord. So I know what he meant. I went to the altar to pray. So I said, God, he said to me, Francis, I want you to take your phone with you. I took my phone into the altar. He said, open up your WhatsApp, your family WhatsApp. Now I'm the only family member. At that time, was in America. Everybody was in Zambia. So the only way I kept up with everybody was to see what's happening on WhatsApp. WhatsApp is the biggest invention for the African. <laughs> Amen? African WhatsApp everything. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> so I, I, I watched up. So I went on my WhatsApp. I just 10 minutes earlier, you know, this is God. My younger sister, Judy, who's a seer prophet, she, but when she dreams, her dreams are, you know, if I dream, don't worry about it. <laughs> if she dreams, you better pray. Because it's going to happen exactly as she says it. So she had a dream. And she said, I had this dream. And in the dream, my mother at this time had gone to be with the Lord. So she was part of the cult of witnesses. My father had also done going to be with the Lord. So she says, I had a dream in which my mother came to me in the dream from the cult of witnesses. And she said, the Lord has sent me to reveal the iniquity you fight. So you guys can go into your destiny. So in the dream, my mother says to, to Judy, let's go. And in the dream, next, the next moment in the dream, they are entering my father's house in Indola. And, and, and she says, Lord, mom, what are we doing in this house? And then she found in the living room, all my father's relatives, alive and dead, were all at a meeting. Because the altars are a place of meeting. She said, what are, they, what are my father's family here. Why won't they let, me, let us alone? Dad is gone. Why won't they leave us? She's saying that to mom. Mom said, don't mind them. The mystery is in the kitchen. We're at the kitchen. So we go to the kitchen and they were, said, in the kitchen, she remember in the kitchen there was an outdoor outside that would be a backyard. And the kitchen door looked like it was a thousand year old. She said, mom, this chicken look, this, this door looks ancient. That's not how our door looks like. I said, that's why, because this thing you're about to, your God wants you to destroy has been in our bloodline for generations. Wow. And then the door opens. And in behind it, there is a shrine and a man dancing on the shrine. Making over, dancing on the shrine and Judy's dream finishes. My mother says, but that's what you must destroy. The dream happens twice in exact detail in the same week, three days apart. So she knew, okay. So she wrote it. As I saw it, God said to me, are you ready to be finally free of what destroyed your father? I said, yes. He said to me, do you not want to know the altar, what the altar your father has always, you, you as a family has fought. Not just me. I saw it. I said, look at, the, said, look at his uncles. Look at his younger brothers. Everybody. What do they do? They were strong workaholics, but they died with nothing to show for it. Because the altar would have scattered by the time they died frail old men. And I saw myself on that journey. Something had to break. With all this anointing, what is this? And God said to me, let me tell you the name of the altar. It's the altar that scatters in Indola. He said to me, 
Get on a plane, get Camilla, go, take your family, hire a car, go to Ndola. It was the house I'd promised myself I'll never go back to, even though we owned it, because it was the house of the biggest pain. It's the only place I saw my father cry, and our family got scattered. We all left crying. So I promised myself I'll never see that house again. And God told me, your place of your greatest pain is the place of your greatest deliverance. Yes. So we, went, we flew from America, and we went to... Dora, and because we still own the house, we told the, the renters, can we go to the back of the house? We're just praying. You know, they didn't want to mess with us, so they let me go in there. So I went to the back, and I asked Judy, Judy, where did, the, where did you see the shrine? And she pointed the exact spot where the shrine was. I said, I know what to do, and, and I know what to do. And I laid them in the court of heaven, and we prayed against our altar. And then I heard God speak, Francis, it's done. You never deal with this again. It's done. You know, the altar has been destroyed. And then he said to me, but ask, he said, he said to me, but now I'll give you recompense. That's when I realized when an altar is destroyed, you get paid for all it took from the family. Amen. 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 He said, I must give you recompense. And he said to me, what altar was this? He says, the altar that scatters. He said, what is the opposite of scattering? He said, gathering. He said to me, son, then live and get ready to see more gathering of resources than you can deal with. And from that day, our ministry in America, in Africa, exploded by 1,000% at least. Business, everything. So I know what I'm talking about. Stand up. Let's deal with yours. Pray in tongues for 30, 60, 60 seconds. Pray in tongues like you know you are in the place of deliverance. Pray in tongues right now or pray in whatever. Just pray. Ask God to do something supernatural. Ask God. I say, God, this is the day. This is it. This is it. My children are not going to deal with this anymore. Amen. I am not going to deal with this anymore. These altars of my father's house, these altars of my mother's bloodline, okay, are not going to control me. Altars of rage, altars of anger, altars of witchcraft, manipulation, altars of divorce, everybody in the family. I mean, broken marriages everywhere. I mean, whatever, what are the altars you are fighting? Altars of poverty. Altar, some of you, you relate to me. Maybe the altar of the scatterer is what you deal with. No matter what you do, things happen to scatter your resources. You have to build again. You are in here. The devil is a liar. God's going to set you free. The Lord is going to set you free. The name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So we're going to pray now. Amen. We're going to pray now. Lift up your hands to the Lord. Because altars are legal entities in the spirit, God told me they can only be fully destroyed by bringing them before the courts of heaven. See, God has a court system where these things can be judged. They are spiritual entities. Natural people go to natural courts. But where do you take spiritual entities? To a spiritual court. I wanted to pray this prayer after me and say, Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father, and my righteous judge. And my righteous judge. The, one the one who provided the salvation. Through Jesus Christ my Lord. Christ, my Lord. Lord, I recognize, Lord, I recognize that, I'm that I'm standing tonight. As a Gideon. As a Gideon in, my in my family. Just like Gideon. Just like Gideon was, anointed was anointed. By the Lord. By the Lord to, destroy to destroy. The evil altars. The evil altars of his bloodline. So his destiny could be released. I am the Gideon tonight. Sent by the Lord. To hear this message. So I can have faith. For the destruction. Of the evil altars. The bondage of iniquity. In my bloodline. Heavenly Father. And righteous judge. I thank you. That the death of Jesus. Has provided, has provided the legal rights that I need, that I need to, prosecute to prosecute and destroy, and destroy every evil altar in my bloodline. In my bloodline. 
in my mother's house, in my father's house, in Jesus' name. Heavenly Father, before I ask you to bring down these evil altars, I ask you to, to I, I, I first of all repent for anything I have in common with ancestral worship and any attendance I ever did willingly or ignorantly to evil altars. In Jesus' name, I'm asking, Lord, that the blood of Jesus would completely cleanse me now in Jesus' mighty name. Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father, now that I've been forgiven, that been forgiven by, the by the blood of Jesus from all my connections, all my connections to, the altars, to the evil altars of my father's house, my father's house and mother's house, and house. Lord, I Lord, I now ask you to revoke, to revoke by the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus all, the all the legal rights, all the legal rights the legal that Satan has had against me and my family because of the erecting of these evil altars by my forefathers. I say those legal rights are now revoked in the name of Jesus. Now, Heavenly Father, I ask you now to release high-ranking angels with sledgehammers to destroy, to go up and down my bloodline to destroy every evil altar in my bloodline. Altars of witchcraft must go. Altars of ancestral worship must come down now in the name of Jesus. Altars of iniquity must go down now in Jesus' name. Altars of infirmity must come down now in the name of Jesus. By the authority of the court of heaven and the blood of Jesus, these altars must go down now in Jesus' name. Heavenly Father, altars of poverty, I say come down now in the name of Jesus. Altars of witchcraft, come down now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Altars of lust and confusion, and confusion and, confusion and depression, and depression in, my in my bloodline. Come down now Come down. in the name of Jesus. Name of Jesus. Every, altar Every altar that has been controlling my destiny <laughs> must come down now. Come down now. All evil altars, altars connected Amen. to the full moon. I declare Amen. that today Amen. by the authority Amen. of Jesus Amen. and my heavenly father, I am now released, I am legally released from every evil altar connected to the full moon or the worship of the moon in the name of the Lord Jesus or the worship of the sun. I am released, I am released from those evil altars. Heavenly Father, I petition your court to now silence every evil altar. I, I petition your court to disengage, to arrest every, every human attendant in my bloodline, even at this moment, who's trying to keep these altars alive. Arrest them, Jesus, in Jesus' name. For today, these altars are coming down in Jesus' name. Heavenly Father, According to 1 Kings 13, the altar must split apart and his ashes must be poured out in the name of Jesus. Lord, now that these evil altars have been judged in my life, Lord, I'm also asking that there will be a release of every breakthrough, every blessing, healing, deliverance, deliverance prosperity, prosperity that these evil altars have stolen from me and my family must now be released in my life in Jesus name give God a shout right now I declare them destroyed 
Come on, give God a shout. Give God a shout. Give God a shout. If you believe God is breaking them, give God a shout in Zion. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Shout Jesus. Jesus.